When New Horizons flew past Ultima Thule on New Year's Day, we got our very first look at a classical Kuiper Belt object. It was unlike anything we'd ever seen before, a contact binary that resembled a dark red snowman. Those initial images were incredible, but they were also low-res thumbnails that were taken just as New Horizons was approaching it. Those images had to be low resolution, because at 6.5 billion kilometers from Earth, New Horizons' download rate was less than 1 kilobit per second. But now the closest images have been taken, and they are at full resolution, and they are spectacular. This image was taken when New Horizons was just 5,358 kilometers from Ultima Thule. This image isn't just our closest look at Ultima Thule. It's a window into the formation of our solar system four and a half billion years ago. Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. And here it is, the best image ever taken of Ultima Thule. In fact, this image made the front cover of the May 17 issue of Science Magazine. The image is actually a composite of two different camera systems on board the New Horizons spacecraft. The Multispectral Visible Imaging Camera, or MVIC, is responsible for capturing the color information of Ultima Thule, while the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, or LORI, is a monochromatic camera, but it has very high resolution. So by combining them, we get the color and details necessary to really understand what's going on on this Kuiper Belt object. Ultima Thule is 43 astronomical units from the Sun. That's 43 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. It rotates once every 16 hours, but its axis is tilted by 98 degrees. And that means it's currently rotating almost face on to the sun like a propeller. The daytime side spends 149 years in sunlight, while the nighttime side spends the equal amount of time in darkness. But at this distance, the daytime side barely rises above 60 Kelvin. That's minus 352 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 213 degrees Celsius. Either way, you cut it, it's cold. The night side is even colder, reaching all the way down to just 30 Kelvin. Not only is its temperature cold, it's also dynamically cold. In other words, it follows a circular orbit around the Sun in roughly the same plane as the rest of the planets. For this reason, it's considered dynamically cold because nothing ever happened to it that would fling it into a higher, more eccentric orbit. That makes Ultima Thule a cold, classical Kuiper Belt object, because it never experienced any perturbation from Neptune or anything else that would fling it into a higher, more eccentric orbit around the Sun. There are hundreds of thousands of Kuiper Belt objects, but they occupy a volume of space beginning at Neptune's orbit at 30 astronomical units, extending all the way out to 55 astronomical units. So that's a lot of space, and therefore the chances of there being an impact between any two classical Kuiper Belt objects is effectively zero. This means Ultima Thule formed in its current orbit four and a half billion years ago and has remained undisturbed ever since. Ultima Thule is a contact binary, with the large and small lobes dubbed Ultima and Thule respectively. There's no evidence of compression fractures or other features that are typical as a result of high-speed collisions. So it seems that these two objects merge together in a slow, gentle collision at just maybe a couple of meters per second. Such environments were common in the early solar nebula. Overall, the nebula was mostly gas and dust, with the proto-sun forming at the center. But throughout the nebula were pockets of denser particles called pebble clouds. Objects coalescing in these clouds would have moved really slow relative to one another, so low-speed collisions were easily possible. Ultima and Thule likely merged together in such a low-speed environment four and a half billion years ago. But its overall shape turned out to be much stranger than it first seemed. Rather than a snowman, Ultima Thule looks more like a walnut stuck to a giant space pancake. This really started to become apparent as additional images were downloaded and compared to each other. The best overall fitting shape model has Ultima Thule at a roughly 30 kilometers in length, 20 kilometers in width, and about 10 kilometers in thickness. The thickness measurement is the least certain because only a small fraction of the nighttime side could be imaged. So the big question is, how did Ultima Thule end up like this? Well, one clue comes from its color, which is red, but it's really more of a very dark red. Ultima Thule only reflects a few percent of the sunlight that falls on it. So think more along the lines of like potting soil, except with a slight tint of red if you shine a bright light on it. 
but both lobes are the same shade of dark red, and that's consistent with the idea that they formed in the same cloud of material. The red color comes from complex organic compounds called tholins. Tholins are produced when smaller, simpler organic compounds are broken apart due to exposure to sunlight. They then recombine and form these larger, more complex macromolecules that have a red color. Organic compounds are found on asteroids, moons, and even comets everywhere we look in the solar system. But the process of tholin creation is usually interrupted by some thermal event, such as when a comet approaches the sun and it really warms up. However, in the outer Kuiper belt, Ultima Thule and other KBOs never really experience any dramatic temperature fluctuations. So the red tholin goo just emerges and spreads all over the surface. In fact, tholins may be the reason we don't see a lot of water in Ultima Thule spectrum. It could be that these complex molecules are, are masking the water signature somehow, or maybe the water is simply underneath a layer of tholin goo. But apart from water and tholins, the only other compound detected is methanol. No carbon monoxide, no ammonia, no acetylene, none of the high volatiles that are common throughout the outer solar system are present. These molecules are abundant on Neptune's moon Triton and on Pluto, but Ultima Thule is about a thousand times smaller than those two other objects, so the, any volatiles that were there probably have long since escaped into space. There was, however, one absorption feature present in the spectra that has yet to be identified, so I'm going with vibranium. Wakanda forever. Ultima Thule has an extremely complex geology with rolling hills, troughs, and some craters. The largest is the Maryland Crater on the Thule lobe. It measures 7 kilometers wide and 2 kilometers deep. Maryland is probably the result of an impact, albeit a relatively gentle one. But the other craters are a lot smaller, no more than a kilometer across. And this suggests that while they could be impact craters, it's also equally likely that they were formed by some other mechanism. For example, there could have been a drainage or a collapse of the interior that would have just opened up a crater, or maybe there were pockets of volatile ices that sublimated once they were first exposed to sunlight. The larger Ultima lobe is made up of eight separate units that appear to be smooshed together like monkey bread. Each unit is five kilometers across. It's possible that they each formed independently and then later merged somehow to become the Ultima lobe. Such assembly models have been proposed to explain the structures of comets like 67P churyumov gerasimenko and 9P Temple 1. But the individual units making up these comets all have very different sizes. It's really not clear why Ultima's units all seem to be roughly the same size. Meanwhile, the Thule lobe doesn't have any evidence of clumping or assembly. It's possible, though, that when the Maryland crater formed, that event may have resurfaced the rest of the Thule lobe, filling in and erasing any seams or gaps in between the pieces. The brightest region is in the neck. This may be due to fine particles that roll downhill after the merger, or maybe they are larger chunks of ice that were bashed up when the two objects merged together. But then again, why would they merge together in the first place? Why wouldn't they just continue to orbit each other? Well, we're going to investigate that in a moment. But first, I want to thank my Patreon supporters for helping to make this video possible. And I want to offer a special shout out to my newest patron, Rock Howard. Thank you so much for your support. And if you would like to help keep this channel going for the price of a cup of coffee every month, please make sure to head on over to my Patreon page. So far, we've uncovered a lot about the true nature of Ultima Thule. But the big question is, why would they merge together? And why would their long axes be aligned the way they are? That's a very specific alignment and is not something that would occur by random chance. But it is exactly what should occur if the two objects were tidally locked to one another and merged very slowly. Otherwise, the two lobes could merge in any random orientation. But if they're allowed to approach each other slowly enough, then over time, tidal forces will line the two objects up along their long axes. Still, the Ultima lobe remains unusually flat, and we've never seen anything quite like that elsewhere in the solar system. But there are two small moons of Saturn that might offer a clue. Atlas and Pan orbit very close to Saturn's rings, and they've acquired these really large skirts of icy particles from the rings that make them kind of look like flying ravioli. 
These two moons are small and they really don't have very strong gravitational fields. So they're able to build up these really tall walls of snow, which turn out to be really effective defenses against White Walkers. Perhaps the individual pieces of the Ultima lobe formed in the same manner, accreting snow and ice from the surrounding pebble cloud and then later merging to become Ultima. So now we have a workable model as to how Ultima could have formed, and we also understand how tidal forces can keep their long axes aligned together. But why are they actually a contact binary? Why aren't they just tidally locked to each other, orbiting a common center of mass like other Kuiper Belt objects? Well, one of the big surprises from the flyby was that no satellites were detected. And that's really strange because you would think that if there was a pebble cloud that collapses, that there should still be some pebbles around acting as satellites. Well, maybe there were satellites in the early days, but they escaped. As they did so, they would carry away angular momentum, and Ultima and Thule would slow down and lose orbital energy until they eventually merged. Or maybe the lobes lost angular momentum due to drag in the surrounding gas of the solar nebula. As the sun emerged, it blew out a powerful solar wind and later swept away that gas. It's also possible that there were impacts that occurred on the leading edges of both lobes, blunting their forward angular momentum and allowing them to merge that way. It was probably a combination of some or maybe all of these mechanisms that over time dumped angular momentum away from the two lobes, allowing the tidal forces to take hold and bring the two axes together in alignment as they gently merged at two meters per second. In fact, you can model a two meter per second collision yourself by taking a brisk walk into a wall, or you could just do a computer simulation. This is a simulation of about 200,000 particles, which includes both gravity and sliding friction. Blue particles experience no acceleration, and red particles experience the strongest. It turns out that the neck region experiences the strongest acceleration, and this may help explain why the neck is so bright. Although these results were published in the May issue of Science Magazine, the manuscript was submitted at the end of February. At the time, the New Horizons team had only downloaded about 10% of the 50 gigabits of data collected during the flyby. Since then, the download total has risen to about 25%, and that includes the closest approached high-resolution images. There's also some wide-field search data in the hopes of maybe finding some distant satellites of Ultima Thule. If such satellites are found, then that would be a game changer because it would allow the densities of the Ultima and Thule lobes to be measured. That in turn would really help to answer a lot of open questions. Meanwhile, the New Horizons spacecraft is in great health. It has plenty of fuel on board and a full set of working scientific instruments. It's speeding deeper into the Kuiper Belt, so when it's not transmitting data back to Earth, it takes more images with its LORI camera, hoping to find a possible target to fly past next. Ultima Thule is telling us so much about the conditions of the early solar nebula and how it formed. But its formation story is not unique. In fact, most other planetesimals probably formed exactly the same way. Now, some of those planetesimals are still around today. They're asteroids, comets, and even small moons. But other planetesimals combined with yet more planetesimals to become protoplanets, which in turn went on to become the planets that we have today including the one that you and I are on right at the moment. You know, the day of the flyby, I got to interview Dr. Alan Stern and some other project scientists from the New Horizons team. It's really cool to go back and watch those videos and see how much of what they initially thought held up and how much of it has changed since. So I'm going to have a playlist of those videos right here, and I'll see you over there when we're done here. And please make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. I'll see you guys next time, and until then, stay curious, my friends.